My guest today is Stephen Lamb, co-founder of GoGoX. They have 27 million customers, 340 cities operating their service in six countries. They're Hong Kong's first listed unicorn. And Stephen's gonna share his knowledge with you, how he did all of that with just 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. Today's podcast is brought to you in partnership with Hong Kong Broadband Network. They are a purpose-driven telco and a digital transformation solutions leader with operations in Hong Kong, Macau, mainland China and Southeast Asia. And they are a firm believer in change or die. And it's my honor to have them as a sponsor for the podcast today. This special episode of the Unicorn Podcast is in partnership with Start Me Up Hong Kong. The Start Me Up Hong Kong Festival is Asia's leading annual startup event curated by Invest Hong Kong. Returning in hybrid format this year from the 5th to the 10th of September under the theme, A Future Unlimited. If you happen to have missed the festival when listening to this podcast, you can catch all the highlights to the event in the links below. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to hear your story and download your knowledge in this podcast today. Maybe we could kick off by you telling the audience a little bit about yourself. Hi, guys. I'm Stephen Lam. I'm a uh, I'm co-founder of Google X, previously Google Van, um, uh, here in Hong Kong. And then uh, later on, we expanded to Southeast Asia and also China. And we are a, a, a intercity logistic platform connecting the customer and the drivers who drive commercial vehicle around the city for a for some technology, including mobile application, uh, web portal, things like that. So we are kind of a virtual logistic fleet and logistic solution for any business that they are focusing on selling stuff online. And even though traditional logistic company that they need more supply, which is our driver base, to help them out across the region. Maybe we should start where it all began. How, how did this happen? How did you start this incredible company? Well, I started the company back in 2013 with only 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. Um, that's uh, the, the 10 billion the valuation that you mentioned should be in Hong Kong dollars. We were uh, valued at about 1.5 to 1.6 billion US dollar uh, by the time that we were listed uh, two months ago. Uh, but the whole company, no matter how you value it, it was actually started with only 20,000 Hong Kong dollars capital. And it was back in 2013. And Hong Kong was a place that locked that many startups, especially tech startup, And uh, with a co-founding team, all of them are uh, a local Hong Kong uh, grow up kind of kid. So we are kind of quite special for this city as a tech startup at very, very early stage. Yeah, and we have listeners, of course, in Hong Kong, uh, the UK, and America to this podcast. So we need to translate 20,000 Hong Kong dollars is 2,000 pounds, roughly, at today's exchange rate, about 1,500 US dollars. So a lot of people would be really interested to hear um, how you did that. So, so how did you start a company like this with such a small amount of capital? What, what was the process? How, how did you go about doing that? It's because of the co-founding team is really from a really humble background or and also low-income family. Myself, I went to school in California. In Berk- uh, I graduated from UC Berkeley Business School. But actually, when I was a kid, I was really, really bad in academic. Uh, um, there's a public exam here in Hong Kong, which we call HKCED. It's a public exam that all the high school students here need to take. And I failed it for two times, and then I kind of like take the exam for three times. To, to, to graduate from uh, junior high school to senior high school to study at an advanced level from a UK system point of view. And then I, I, when I was in advanced level, um, I dropped out from high school. And then my dad gave me a 200 US dollar and one way ticket to California uh, to continue my education. And hopefully I, I can do something by learning from California before I, I go to university because I was too bad in academically. And, and my dad just don't believe I can get into any university in my life. So why don't you don't waste time here in Hong Kong, try your new life in, in California. And my uncle actually living in California for, for over 20 years. And he want my uncle to give me a lesson, life lesson, how to take care of myself. And then your, your close family is not with you. Okay, if you need help, your uncle will help, but it's not like the parents. So, 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 so that's what my, my dad pushed me to. And then I think because of that experience, I have to survive uh, for my living at school in California. So I went to a, a, a community college and then worked after school in a Chinese restaurant as a delivery guy. 
and then through all this process, I, I, I managed to, to push myself to not only do well in school because I have very limited time, limited time in school, but at the same time, I need to pay off the tuition, the living expense, and I need to pay for gas because California is just like big places, just commute between school, home, and, and Chinese restaurant. It, it costs a lot of time uh, without driving. So I need to buy my car, things like that. And then I end up doing quite well by, by studying really hard. Uh, because I treasure every single second when I was in school, and then once I've time, I, once I've got a chance, I went to a Chinese restaurant to to wash the dishes, and then end up be a delivery guy for a Chinese restaurant for many years, and uh, that's where I met two very good friends, Lick and Reef, that also went to the same community college and work for the same Chinese restaurant, and they are also from Hong Kong. Then three of us become really really good friends. And, and we understand how difficult it is to just survive school and work. And uh, we always look for interesting uh, business ideas to make some money so that we can pay off our university tuition two years down the road. So we started to do a lot of funny business, uh, selling secondhand stuff on eBay, uh, fix some used car and then sell it to classmates, uh, ho uh, selling hot dog in, in, in parking lot, a lot of funny things. Um, that's how we make kind of some living expenses and by 2007 uh, we, the, the first generation iPhone came out uh, it got released when everyone saying it's a very stupid phone without the keyboard uh, everyone is on Blackberry we, we love the keyboard uh, but I, 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 I love the idea that it's a smartphone and then I search on eBay and find out okay actually a lot of people searching for it and it's only available in California or in the state uh, then I, I, people around the world looking for a paying for a lot of money to just buy one, and then we started to learn how to how to unlock a jailbreaking iPhone to sell it into the world. I think that's the 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 the, the, the ticket for us to make some money, and then we we did that for a period of time, and we by selling our first generation iPhone over eBay, we make enough money to pay off the tuition. I went to UC Berkeley, and I'm an out of state student in in in, in the uh, in in the system, so I pay much more expensive tuition fee, but uh, we managed to to pay off every single penny of the living expense and tuition by ourselves, and then we graduated from there. Uh, because of that experience, I think uh, everything is require your your hard work and and just keep thinking how to adapt. And by the time we want to start our own business, because we have so many uh, experience on selling stuff, doing business, small business, and then we. When we have only twenty thousand to start the company, it doesn't seem a a problem to us. We just need to figure out okay, with only twenty thousand, what we need to do. I think if we look back when we started the company, um, with only limited capital, it's actually a good thing because we try to solve the problem or the pain point by a real solution. It's not by money because we when we scale up the company with resources, we are scaling up the solution. Without uh, solving the pain points or the problem, if we have a lot of money at the beginning and we scale the company too early, I think we are scaling up the problems instead of the solutions. So I think that's how we we kind of started from only twenty thousand capital, but still uh, twenty thousand Hong Kong still managed to go through many years. So many points in your story there. I don't want my audience to miss. You know the. Um... The point you're making about having little money to figure out the problem is a misunderstood. A lot of people think they need a lot of money to start a company, but I couldn't agree with you more. Actually, it's better to have little money at the beginning, like you say, quite rightly. Then you can figure out what the actual solution is instead of throwing money at something that hasn't yet solved a problem for people to try and make it work as opposed to figure out how it, how it will work. So how did you figure out with that little bit of money? how to solve the problem for people. What, what, how did it come about that this idea that had never been done before suddenly was there on your plate as a solution that you could now scale up? Because you did later raise 375 million. So at some point you realized, hey, this needs money to scale. But, but how did you get to that point? Well, um, I, I think, well, long story short, um, we, uh, with the co-founders, before Google Van, now we call it Google X, um, we actually selling lunch boxes to Chinese restaurant in Hong Kong. There were more than 600 restaurants using our advertised lunch box. Okay. So, so we put advertisement on empty lunch box so that we gave it out for free to restaurant to use. 
And every single day, we need to do the logistics to move all these boxes to, 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 to the restaurants. And then we find out there's a huge logistic problem because we need to deliver the buses all around Hong Kong. It's a very small city, but over like 18 districts, it's a nightmare already. And we don't have the capital to buy our own vehicle. And then end up, we have to connect all these drivers on a WhatsApp group and then communicate with them and see, make sure, and see if they can do our job. Okay, uh, the other, uh, other method is called the call, uh, radio frequency, which is what we call the call centers to, to arrange the logistics. But end up, the call center are not doing a very good job. When you call, they said that you, they can get it done. After two hours, they can't find anything. If you call back, they just forget who you are. Then they, uh, obviously, they are not that polite uh, uh, here in Hong Kong. So we have to solve our own problem to improve the logistics so our lunchbox business can keep growing. But by the time that we want to solve the logistic problem, we find out a lot of people actually sharing the same ping pong that we do. It's so difficult to arrange uh, kind of last minute on demand logistics. And, uh, and with very limited capital, we cannot buy our own vehicle. So we can only rely on the resources on the street. So we started to talk to the drivers on the street and then we find out how the, uh, the limitation of radio frequency as a old generation of technology. If we use smartphone or mobile application, then we can actually connect to a lot of drivers in a very short period of time without a physical or, 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 or physics uh, uh, physical limitation of the radio frequency band can only be available for 10, 15, 10 kilometers with the antenna, things like that. And that's very hilly here in Hong Kong, a lot of district. You have to set up multiple antenna on top of the building so that you, you got the coverage. But mobile application, actually, as soon as you have the network, you can receive the signal. So anywhere in Hong Kong, you can get the orders through the mobile application. And then any driver within the city can understand the demand of the city. So we think it's a really kick-ass idea then we started to develop the, the mobile application uh, by inviting two more co-founders. So end up uh, with myself, Nick, and with we met in California, we invite two more co-founders. One is Chris and one is James. Uh, they focus on the product development and the design. Then five of us form the co-founding team and put, to that, put together that $20,000 as a starting. And then with so limited capital, we can't do a lot of stuff. So. Uh, Chris and James, they focus on product development and three of us focus on the operation. We walk on the street to talk to the drivers every single day. What is your ping pong? How I can design a driver app that can help your day much better. Design to what they mentioned to us. And then we, when we launch the driver app to the drivers, they actually love it because we actually listen to them and then do iteration day by day uh, on a day by day basis. So that's how we use a very limited uh, uh, capital, but started to just talk to our customer and driver or target audience directly, and then through the co-founding team, make the adjustment and then launch to the target group specifically. And then once we launch to the driver group, and then every morning we just hand out flyers around the subway station here, and then to make sure we understand what kind of customer or what kind of people interested in take out the flyers and ask questions to us, what is it about? And then we will write it down, okay, that is an office lady from a trading company. And then what, when, when we do marketing or we want to reach out, we want to find this group of customers. So that's how with a very limited capital, we have to do things uh, kind of really uh, old fashioned, but actually it worked really well. And it make the co-founding team understand the market uh, to the point that what we really need. And by the time we raise money, okay, we raised several rounds. You mentioned that we raised 300 something million over many, many rounds, um, that we know how to spend the money on the right group of customer, right group of segment. So we don't waste the capital that we have. Incredible story. And if people have just listened to that, I think they just got a business business class for free. And, and I just want to kind of make sure that everyone listening grasps what just we were just told because it's quite quite incredible you start with a business called box ad and you need you have a problem that you solve because you don't have money you can't buy a van if you'd been given money for box ad you might have bought a van and go go x might never exist today right there's a brilliant case study there of why having no money can be really powerful a direct correlation between you having no money therefore having no van for your original model means you find out this pain point for your business that other people have the other thing that i think is vital in the story that you just talked about is 
the concept that most people probably thought that the customer, original customer, was the person booking the van. But what you did differently is you spent time talking to the van drivers, getting to know their pain points, understanding what they needed. And when people are thinking about their customers, sometimes you have to go one step beyond the customer you think and understand the supply, right? So your original customer is the driver. Correct, correct. And that is brilliant. Yeah, to, uh, well, I can answer that uh, or add some more color. A lot of people thinking uh, to build a platform is a chicken and egg problem. But to me, it's not. Always build the supply side before the demand. Because sometimes, okay, depends on which, con- uh, which country and which uh, industry you are, uh, supply can wait. Because supply want business. But your customer, when they look for something, they may want it now or today or tomorrow. If you tell them, okay, oh, I have that. Okay, I have that, but I will come back one month later. I'm going to prepare it for you. Okay, then they will go to other place and never return. But when you have the supply waiting there, and then you have enough supply, so the customer coming to your shop, coming to your platform, look, can find out what they want, and you have it immediately, then you have your, their business. And the next time, they will think of you. Yeah, so that's, that's how I think of about building a platform. You've solved the chicken and egg. You basically said uh, egg first, egg first. I mean, build supply first. I've actually never heard that point before. It's actually a very good one. I think the reason people don't build supply first is because it's it can it's can perceived as quite expensive to build supply first, right? It's difficult. If you've got customers, you can you've got one customer, you've got one supply, you can match them together and make some income. If you spend too much time on the supply, a lot of money can get lost before you've got a sale. Right. So yes, how did you yes. balance that out? How did you how did you balance those two out? Did you did you build supply with two or three and then get a few customers on board? Uh, we built a supply because we were delivering lunch boxes around the city. So we actually know a group of drivers quite a lot uh, in the city. And then we set ourselves a target of 3,000 drivers before we launch, before we let, launch the platform. So uh, during the, the, the period that we are building the mobile application, then uh, the operation team, which myself, like, and we three of us, we walk on the street, talk to drivers every single day, telling them we are going to launch this product uh, in three months of time. We are inviting a group of drivers to test it. We are only launching in three months of time, okay? Uh, if you are a good driver, pro night, blah, 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 then, okay, please join, okay? But when we are ready, we will come back and talk to you and tell you how to do it. And then we just keep walking on the street for, for literally like, like two to three months of time. And then we talked to like the like 10,000 different people, I think over the three months. Some of them, they keep me out from, from, from their vehicles. Some, they think I'm selling stuff. Um, and then end up, we collect uh, more than 3,000 driver contact and we keep them in top, keep them warm. Okay. Saying that, okay, this is the progress that we have. Next month, we are doing this, doing that. Okay. Very soon, we will launch the, 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 the mobile application. So by the time we launch, actually not 3,000, but a couple hundred of drivers actually stay active talking to us. So we have a, a good enough base to jumpstart the whole platform at the beginning. That's how, how, how we did it. Mm, amazing, amazing story. Now, you mentioned something I think that the people listening will be interested in. You mentioned having five founder partners. And so how did you structure that? How did you, for example, people listening want to get the partnership right? What did you do right? What did you do wrong in those early days? Did you have shareholder agreements? Did you make everyone's job well clear? What were the useful things looking back that people might find uh, say useful? Well, I, I think that's a miracle. But uh, if you ask me, it's actually quite straightforward. We don't have a very clear shareholder agreement. Therefore, having an agreement. And we actually have a very funny story when we go, we were uh, going for public and we found out, um, I told you guys, like 20,000 initial capital, right? So five guys, uh, each of us contribute 4,000 Hong Kong. Then it's 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. And then through, through the, the IPO process, we found out the initial capital we had in the bank was only 16,000. Just we didn't check it until recently. And then we found out one of us did not deposit that 4,000. <laughs> and we actually didn't know. No. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, wow, you that's how, amazing. How, how 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 informal we are, but uh the co-founding team, four of us still working with the company really well, and then one one guy left the company up uh, uh like four years ago, but we are in good terms. The, uh the guy left is a our our CTO, okay, the technical founder. He's a very good excellent engineer. He just hates managing people. 
if you ask them to ask him to build anything, he will build, build for you. But if you ask him to talk to like like twenty different engineers every single day, he said it's like life is so boring. Yeah, I want I want to build something new. So we are very good term. And I think uh, five of us stay in very good relationship over nine years of building the company with billions of dollars on the table as interest. Uh, we will fight, right? And I think uh, we 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 kind of have. I think this is a very very good example to to share with you all. Is uh, five of us know each other for a long time, and we trust each other uh, on our life. We can bet my life on on these guys. And then at the early days, instead of share the agreement, we had this conversation. Five of us, when we started the company, we said, okay, let's do this. Uh, we are not rich, okay? So if we want to really want to do this, uh, are we the best partner for each other? Imagine five of us going to an empty room with a gun and one billion dollar cash on the table, okay? If you kill each other, you fight, okay? The two people. Take turns going to the room. You take turns, okay? If you pick up the gun and, and, and kill the other co-founders and take the one billion, no one in the world would know. Okay, what would you do? And then uh, I think this is a miracle, and surprisingly, all of us, we decided the third option. We walk out the room without touching the gun and that one billion dollar. I think this is a life journey. If we can share this journey together, great. If we can make money together, great. If we fail, and end up with nothing. Hopefully, this is a wonderful experience that we build something together and just forget about it in the history and then move on. I think with that conversation, it can't kind of define the relationship. No matter how, how many fights and arguments that over the years, um, how, how much money on the table, uh, we end up having a very, very good discussion from the bottom of our heart. What is the most important? Yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of how we structure it. My I'm just kind of <laughs> amazed and I, it, if it, it restores my faith in humanity when I hear this because, because I, having spoken to nearly 200 entrepreneurs in my podcast career, um, there's always disputes and arguments and le legal issues and it, it is incredible and heartwarming to hear that this still happens in this world, you know, that people can trust each other and, and, and have that uh, respect and honour and um, I, I absolutely love it, and it's and it's an inspiration. And and do you see going forward as the business grows? You mentioned something that I think is really interesting. You know, where one of the co-founders said, "Look, this isn't fun for me anymore. It's not that I don't like you guys. It's not that I don't like the business. It's not fun for me anymore." I think that's really strong of him to do that. That's actually really hard to just accept that this stage of the company isn't right for you, and you leave. And I and I and I think that's quite encouraging. Was that a difficult conversation though? When he said he was leaving, I mean, I know I had a CTO in one of my companies, and he said he was going to leave. I think I almost cried. You know, like they're hard yeah. to come by, right? Of course, it's difficult. When I describe it, at that that couple of days uh, when we understand that he wanted to leave, it's like it's like of like bring up with a girlfriend. You know, yeah. Why leave? Why we are not good enough? Things like that. <laughs> But after yeah. spending a lot of time together, we, we know his personality. By the time that we ask him to, to, to manage a team, we understand he's not happy. When, when we hang out as a co-founding team, tell, tell him, share, share with the, uh, his name is Chris, by the way, he, he doesn't mind. I, 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 I call his name and then he understands really well. Uh, uh, Chris is like, uh, I love working with you guys. I can build anything you guys ask. But if you, Ask me to build something and I need to tell 10 different pair of hands how to do it. I rather do it myself, but you give me more time. Okay. Because he's kind of like a very engineer kind of geek. Um, from if you don't know him well, he only gives you a zero and one answer. Yes or no. And then what? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and, and, and by the time you understand his motive and it's not, not nothing about the business, it's just his personality, what I enjoy the most doing things. And then we, we kind of, uh, Kind of made an offer and agree. Okay, he said I don't mind keep all my shares in the company, and you don't need to buy me out anything. Okay, I, I just keep my shares there. You can do whatever you want. Uh, if you waste money, dilution, anything is fine. You you take the company to the next level. Um, if you need my advice or anything to teach any junior engineers on like Python, uh, uh, Java, I'm more than happy to do that. 
But if you ask me to manage a team, no problem. If you want me to hire the CTO, no problem. But if you want me to stay to manage a big team, I'm out. So, okay, we understand <laughs> that. Then we just follow what he wants. Big shout out to you, Chris. A lot of respect for you if you're listening, <laughs> really. I I, uh, I hope to meet you one day. That's just awesome. And and I think that yeah. you're t- touching on something else there that's quite important for people maybe to learn from mm. you. It, so, you you know, it's, it, you, the five of you start a business and you have this incredible bond, this incredible trust, um, this sense of purpose beyond making money. But then investors come in and investors will have the need for structure and legal mm. pay paperwork and 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 no no one releases uh, 375 million without knowing you know everything's in line so <laughs> did things change when you when you brought in the investors how how did you go about getting investors yeah i think it did change and especially when we have our first professional investor uh, after two rounds of angels um the two rounds of angel investor they are kind of quite casual they believe in the team and our idea and they saw our execution really to the point that uh, scaling of the company. But when we have professional investors uh, interested in the company, uh, they bring in a lot of clarity what we need. And uh, I think we are very fortunate uh, when those investors appear, they not only uh, gave us money, but also a lot of clarity what we need to do. For example, the organizational structure that we did not uh, really pay attention on, what kind of talent that we need, um, they really kind of uh, give us a, a, a new uh, point of view and a perspective. So we started to build a team based on their advice. And uh, we, we, since then, we, we actually uh, can attract much more different group of talent. And we started going international. And uh, I think by the time that we, uh, we raise our Series A of investment in Singapore, uh, the, the decision maker actually is a very, very seasoned businessman in Southeast Asia. And he shared with me how to build a company culture, what kind of talent, how the training, onboarding is so important. All these details, which I, as a as a uh, young entrepreneur, and, and I've never had a full-time job in my life. So I actually don't know about this. And uh, when we when he shared all the story, how he built those companies from a small company to, to, to a listed company, to even uh, being a Fortune 500 uh, management team, then he shared all this management experience with me. I, I, I definitely learned a lot from them. But how we bring them on is actually we just keep focusing on building the business. And then the numbers are going to do really well. The angel investor actually started to introduce us to their friends. And then we start to make a lot of uh, uh, connections and referrals to professional investors. I think after talking to so many, we get uh, a few of them interested in bringing our business model not only in Hong Kong, but expanded to Southeast Asia. They believe it's a huge market that the team actually have the ability and execution to do it right with very limited resources. So that's how we, we close the first uh, uh, professional investor. Then um, after that, we have several run more, then those requirements is higher and higher. Yeah. So I think there's another like chicken egg uh, scenario, isn't it? And, and what you're saying is the solution is just build a great business and the investors will come. Because a lot of people think they need to get the investors on board first in some respects but you focused on just making the business work get the numbers in and and that seemed to do the sales for you to the investors is is that how i'm i'm interpreting it right yeah we are running on a very limited budget and uh, by the time that we were meeting investor we want to get their money but we are not like um without your money we can't survive okay if with your investment we can do it faster without your investment we are going to do it slower then we are not begging for it. But uh, at the same time, I think because of that, the investors know that we are we, the priority is to build a great company, great product. That's always number one. If you, With your help, you can be part of it and help us to do a better job and much faster. Great, let's work together. If not, then we are okay. I think that is the, the, the priority that we set. And investors back in the days actually liked that. Um, they always look at the team because when the team is always talking about money, 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 and they don't know their business well, then I think as an investor, even today, if I invest in some, some other startup, you, you haven't really figured out what you want to do and what you really need. And I think uh, one of the lessons that I learned is at the early days, there's an investor that I met. I, it's a random, random uh, person that I, I, I met over some startup event. And then he asked me, hey, Stephen, if I have one, you said you want capital, right? I give you one million US dollar today. 
you get the check and you get the money in the bank tomorrow. Okay, what are you going to do with my money? Actually, I didn't come up with a really good answer. With one million in the bank, is it twenty percent to marketing, thirty percent to product R and D? What you need to do R in R and D? How many people that you need to build so that your R and D is going to be accurate? Do you live with the product on time so that you have the right product market fit? I can't answer those questions. Then he said, Stephen, your problem is not a $1 million. You don't need money. You need a very, very clear head what you need to do and how to do it. And then if you have that answered in your mind, then communicate really well so you don't need $1 million. Tell me to get you from here to six months later, your target, maybe only 100000 or even 50000 can get you there. So why you need so many money today? So much money today. So so I think that was a very good challenge and question from that investor. I ended up didn't get this money, but I think that clear my mind what I need to do with money. It's a great lesson for people listening. And in fact, anyone listening right now that thinks they need money, are you very sure you need money? And what will you do with the money? It's such a great thing. Go away and write down exactly what you would spend the money on. And uh, I think it's a great, great point. And do you think that, the, uh, any lessons you learned um, with the investors, bringing them on board, anything we could share with the audience that might help them, um, things you wish you had done, things you wish you hadn't done, um, you know, any, any surprises? Um, you know, what... Do your research. Uh, uh, in, in nowadays, the time is D-Y-O-R. Do your own research <laughs> uh, before you believe uh, that guy is an investor. I have, I've came across so many people call themselves investors but they are actually not. They call their professional investor, but they may be not even an angel investor. They never invest in tech. They bought some property, then they tell you they're an investor. And, and they have like 10,000 US dollars to invest. And then you were looking for like 100,000 and then they call themselves investor. And then I, because we are in Asia, a lot of traditional investors trying to invest in tech. Then they put up a lot of traditional terms. They, they, they ask for a huge redemption cost or, or redemption rights. Uh, so that after two years, if you're not uh, fulfilling their requirement, their KPI, then they they want to take their their money back with uh, uh, a like a IRR internal rate of return like twelve percent, like you are paying like yearly twelve percent interest to them. But you know that you are running on startup, you need money to spend. But uh, in two years, if things doesn't work out, you don't have the money to 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 pay back, right? Uh, so it give a, a additional layer of pressure to a lot of funders. Um, so all these are uh, 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 little, little gritty stuff that uh, need to pay attention on, and then don't believe everything, but uh, trust each other because once you get their money and then uh, the money in the bank, the share the agreement is signed, then you are like a couple, okay? You are like a relative, okay? You are on the same goal, on the same boat, that the same direction. Make sure you communicate really well. When things go wrong, say it. Don't keep it under the the the, the table. And then at the last minute, you, you, you discover everything is really shitty, you know, a uh, project of the, of the language. Then we don't want, like, when shit hit the fan, the investor or the shareholder is the last group of people to know. They you want them to be on your side, help you out, okay? So, so from, from raising the money, okay, work very hard to close the run, and then don't rely on the money until money in the bank. Don't make crazy decisions, overspend, cut your one way. Just believe you sign a timesheet, okay? The timesheet can change and market can change. Okay, for example, interest rate just suddenly re- uh, increased recently, okay? When interest rate increased, the cost of investment increased like a lot, okay? That's okay for investors to turn around and invest in some alternative instead on you guys because the return is not there anymore. So uh, it's better for me to just put in the money in the bank, right? So it makes a lot of sense. It's nothing wrong with the investor and don't rely on that. After you close it, your investor in your, is on your team. Show them the real business, the real team, who you are 100%. Uh, the more you're hiding when you are running into trouble or challenge, they are the first group of people that you should let them know. And they are the first group of people that are willing to help you. If you hide everything and they don't want to help you, then you are creating much more enemies than the market uh, itself. So, so that's my, my, my two cents, how to build a company over the years with investors or shareholders. I wish I'd heard this before. I, um, I had a comic book business in Hong Kong uh, called Devashard. And, um, and I, uh, I, I, I believed someone 
when they said they were going to invest. And then I grew the platform thinking we went to Comic-Con and went crazy thinking it was going to be this massive comic book in Hong Kong. And then the investor didn't follow through. Uh, but it took about six months for the investor to not follow through. They kept saying, yes, they were going to send the money. They were, and I kept believing them, you know, because I'm an idiot. Um, so uh, I, <laughs> I, I believe in some of them too. Yeah, it's, 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 but it's, you know, you've you, you got to be um, carefully, you know, optimistic, you know, like that's it, carefully yes, optimistic, right. right? So, but it's a, it's a great point and not talked about enough um, because a lot of people um, and where the money comes from matters as well. You know, like at the end of the day, you want some, like you say, that's going to be there to help you. Um, raising the money from them is not the end of it. So such, such great insight. Do you think, going forward i mean your your parents how do they feel now your family you know they've seen you shipped you off away from hong kong because um you know you were you were failing in school and, and um <laughs> I'm, I, you know i've I spent 20 years in hong kong so i know there was probably some like oh a bit disappointed in you you know like you could do so much better and and, and now you know how how, do, how does it how does it transpire how does it, how does your family feel about the success you've had um my parent is very traditional what we call chinese parents so to speak, um, they always don't believe in what I do and they don't understand it because my, both of my parents, they are not educated. They, they didn't even graduate from primary school because back in the, uh, because of history. Um, then when I told, I, it's very funny that when I told them I got straight A's and GPA 4.0 that I got into Berkeley, the first reaction of my mom is like, hey kid, uh, if you screw up in your school, it's fine. Just be honest. We want you to be an honest person. Okay. If you cannot get into any university, it's okay to tell us the truth. I said, no, I got into Berkeley Business School. I got a straight A's. I think I spent like two days to convince them. And I took photos of the, the admission letter to them and saying, uh, saying to my sister. And my sister actually, did you fabricate this? <laughs> <laughs> Without showing it to my parents, and I really questioned it. Um, then uh, over the years, well, by the time that I graduated, I come back. Um, they want us to get a job. I couldn't. I, I, I just end up didn't get a job, and I said I started a business on my own. I, I could take care of myself when I was in California. I think um, I, I can do something on my own here in Hong Kong. It just took time. And every night or every other night, my, my mom would say, hey, look at your, your cousin. They didn't go to... California, they didn't study abroad, okay, they got a very good job in, in HSBC, you know, making good money. Why don't you talk to them and see what they did, okay, maybe you can get a job there uh, for many years. And then until I, I started Google Man for like two, three years, uh, they know I, I, I don't give a shit about what they would tell me what to do. Then they started, uh, I think now they are happy, uh, I'm on my own, but I'm do they understand what I'm working on? Kind of. They still don't know what is what is happening on the smartphone in a way. So, so, so I think they're happy. Yeah, I'm fortunate to have uh, to have my parent like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they clearly love you, and uh, and I think the honesty point. That's the best thing a parent can do is just say, be honest, right? But um, I, I find it amazing. It must have been quite hard for you not to get a job. You must have. I mean, uh, in the in the many years you've been building this business, were there moments where you did think? Right, a bit like Chris, it's time to leave. I should have you thought about quitting? How how did you stick it out? Oh yes, yes, definitely. If I'm I'm saying that no, I'm okay. Um I think I'm lying to everyone, including myself. Um actually that's a lot of time. Uh several years ago when I was in a Forbes uh, 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 conference in Singapore, I, I say to the public that I'm the bottleneck of the company. And and I think it's true, I've never had a full time job. I never manage a team of 10, 50, 100, and 1,000. If I can tell everybody that I know how to manage a team, I, I think I'm lying. I, I, I said the same to my shareholders, but I'm willing to learn. And that's the reason why we need to build a very, very good team. I'm not the best in all the area. I don't know legal. I don't know finance. I can whip here and out up to university level that get me a good A in the class. But I don't, I'm not a CPA. I'm not a professional trained. I'm not a professional trained lawyer. So really people like that know what I don't know. And the founder, I, as a founder, I think uh, the fortunate, uh, really lucky that I realized the, uh, the, the problem of myself is I don't know what I don't know. And I keep exploring that point and bring in talent and team member that understand what is the weakness of the team and the company and they are willing to help out. 
And one of my job is to build that great team. And I think I'm enjoying every single bit building that team. Even though I'm facing a lot of challenge, I, I wanted to quit uh, many, many times because I just don't know how to move on or proceed. Then after talking to the team, talking to the right people, advisor, mentor, then I try to put things together. And then if I make some mistake, that could be, and uh, we, if we are forced to make some decision that I have no idea uh, or not 100% of the information, then let's make a decision better than no decision. All these things created a lot of uh, moments that I question myself. But over the years, looking back, those are the moments I learned the most. And then the, the, the moment that I actually figure out uh, and learn with the team and understand the team, what we are good at and what kind of game that we, we can play, what kind of game that we can't. Uh, I love uh, watching NBA. So, so if you are, you are against Warriors, uh, Stephen Curry, okay. If you play O'Leal, that like O'Leal there uh, as a center, yeah, he just keeps shooting the three pointers, okay? Who cares if you have a sentence? One faster than me, please. Something like that, right? You, 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 you know what kind of games that you can, we can play. And then I think over the years, I just love trying to figure out what kind of game that we can play and adapt according to the market, according to, 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 to for example, COVID, then what kind of team members that we need. Um, I just enjoy that process. Well, Steve Jobs famously said that uh, he shouldn't be the CEO of Apple and he should bring in someone else. And they brought in the guy that was running Coca-Cola, right? And he thought that was the right move. And yeah. uh, But there's a certain startup culture that I think sometimes only the founders can keep alive, right? So did you, did you work? I know... Uh, I know a few people that worked in your company and the culture is one of the things they talk about, your openness, your honesty, your uh, dedication to the product and the clients. But did that, did you sit down and talk about culture in the early days? Or is, is that happened naturally or is, where does that come from, company culture? I think we started to realize uh, we need a company culture and really keep talking about a company culture after two, three years of uh, building the company. And by the time that we think um, the front line People, when they pick up the phone, how they treat the drivers and the customer, the way they talk, is very different from who we are, okay? We just keep, keep uh, there was a period of time, I, I, I'm kind of like, keep going to the call center, talk to our customer service, be polite, okay? That's the number one requirement. Nothing else before we can think of a solution or how to solve the problems of the customer, please be polite. And then I, after a while, I find out, why I need to keep repeating that? Isn't it people like just the fundamental DNA that we should have in this company? Then I, I figure out we need some training, like house rules, okay? You come into this house, these are the rules that you have to obey. If you don't agree this set of values, how we do things, I'm sorry, this is not the right place for you. Nothing wrong with you, just we are different. Can we be good friends? I don't know. We can hang out for one day, but if we work together side by side every single day, I don't know if it work out really well. I just make you unhappy. So we try to figure out that, and then we end up thing, saying that we need a set of values, and that becomes the community culture. And then we start to structure a community culture that actually means something. And then over several years of evolution, generation of change, now we have like five uh, uh, culture co actually right behind my my, 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 my comments room here, stick it on the wall. Uh, the first one is dare to venture. We are willing to try new things. The second one is low BS. Okay. If we say something, we do it. If you say something and don't do it, okay, saying for fun is okay. But otherwise, we are not, not doing, it's not executing to what we said. Okay. And then the third one is top of your game. Either we are not in the game. If you are want to play the game on the court, you want to be the best. Like, like the NBA game I mentioned, right? Okay. Otherwise, yeah. Why don't you be a soccer player or play something else? This one is repair NBA. Come on. <laughs> so top of your game. And then, uh, the, the fourth one is grow or die. Keep learning. The world is changing so fast that even myself, I don't know what is the world is heading to. I never expected COVID. We never expected that we call up talk about or discuss new normal. What is new normal in a normal day? Come on, okay? That's, that was not happening. Grow or that keep learning. And then why so many requirements to ourselves every single day? The result is deliver happiness to our, uh, our business partners, customers, drivers. So that's the, the culture that we have. And we have been using this set of culture for four or five years now. And every team member onboarding, they need to learn about it, agree with it. 
and even our interview question, we are surrounding this question and, and understand if they share the same, same value so that we invite them to the team. I think it's incredible values. And, and with your permission, Stephen, can everybody listening copy those values? Do you mind? Well, I, I, well, I, I, I didn't create it. I just copy and paste them somewhere else. So <laughs> everything's, a, everything's a copy of something else. But no, I, I, think, I think that's uh, really, really good. Now, this, this is a deep question, a very deep question for you. Do you, do you have any regrets? I do. Actually, I have lots of regrets. Uh, but after making those we can't, those decisions that make you regret, you actually don't know you will regret. Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. So, so I think regret is something that looking back, you regret you didn't do something. But without making that decision, actually after, the, after that time or, or in the future after that, you actually don't know you can regret on that thing. You understand what I mean, right? Yeah. So let's say you have option A, option B, you make an option A. Without making option A, you don't regret, I should have made an option B. But if you pick option B, why regret, okay? But that regret is actually a lesson. The reason why you regret is the lesson. It's not regretting, it's the lesson. Okay, why I'm regretting? Okay, actually at that time, I should understand a little bit more of that problem. Listen to that custom. Listen to that team member of their opinion before I make the move. That's why I'm regret. Then the next art action should be, okay, last time I did not listen to my team. Okay, so this time I should listen to my team and by how much and when we should make the decision so that we don't regret. I think that is the lesson you should learn from those regrets. Yeah, that's how I look at it. Any example, okay. any particular example that jumps to mind, just thinking, you know, um, what people can learn from, from, let's call it your mistake. Well, a lot of mistakes. I think without making those mistakes, we won't be where we are today, to be honest. Uh, the world always better if we imaginating we should have or could have done something. Um, so I think the regret, or some of the regret that I, I kind of stick to my mind is um, actually share with you the same experience that I, I trusted some investor by signing the time share. Okay. And I, I believed in them too early. And then because of my ignorance of that time shit or that, uh, that trust or that belief, and then I hurt the expectation of my team. And actually, a, a lot of team members believe in me. They, they are doing according to what I believe in and they, they, they execute. And then end up, we couldn't close the money or the resources that we need. We call back to the team that, hey, I'm sorry, the, the 10 people that you, you hire, we have to fire them today. Mm. Yeah. It was a very difficult moment. And then I, I, I failed the team. I failed their expectation. I think that's something I regret. And ultimately, the, the manager who managed that uh, a team of 10, he left. Yeah. Because I, I did not, I, I did not want to talk. I, I, I did not, uh, trans, translate that promise or that agreement into reality, uh, to them. So, so something like that. Oh, it's a very tough one, isn't it? I mean, I think anybody listening's probably been there in life, and I and I I think it's don't want to lose the uh, naivety. Sometimes you want to keep that belief in people. I mean, you want. I believe humans are good people, but I guess sometimes people themselves just uh, make I mistakes. Still do. Yeah, still you do. still yeah. got to. Yeah, which I know you do. Uh, Stephen, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I've got one last question before before we go. Mm. Um, if you went back to your younger self and, and gave some advice, w w anything uh, in particular you think would be um, useful for young Stephen? I think uh, I would love to read more when I was a kid. I think I started to, to love reading and learning from other people when I was in Berkeley or in the United States. Uh, I hate reading when I was a kid. I just running around, love like doing random thing, video games all the time. Um, and by, by the time that I, I, I love reading other people's experience, uh, new subject, I, I, I find it fascinating to learn. Uh, and I think I would look for more mentor and or advisor or good friends that are older than me, have been there, done that, share their life experience, how to coach people, how to overcome some challenges, stay positive, uh, uh, all, all these kind of things, uh, when, when I can start earlier, I think um, I would do much better to overcome some of the challenge in the early days. Uh, now it's not too late uh, since I realized it, uh, but, but I, I would love to, to, to start it much earlier. 
Well, Stephen, um, I'm proud to uh, know you. I'm so uh, impressed with you and your team and what you've achieved. I know how Hong Kong is proud of you. We permanently in Hong Kong uh, talk about you as the, um, the the first ever company to be listed, uh, Unicorn in Hong Kong, and how proud we are of what you've achieved. And um, so congratulations. It's just the beginning, I know, for you. So I'm really excited to see. Yeah, it's a new chapter. This thing is just a little chapter. Yes, I know. Yes, yes. Uh, But it's been wonderful to talk to you. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. And thank you for everyone listening to this podcast. I hope you found today's podcast both inspiring and useful. And if you need more help, visit PurposefulProject.com where all the resources to help you start and grow a business are free.